Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me again here today as we talk about COVID-19 and the effects on Erie County specifically. As you may have heard, Governor Tom Wolf and Secretary Levine have extended the stay at home order through April 30th for all counties currently under that order within the Commonwealth, and this includes Erie County. So therefore, all of us in Erie County now are under a extended stay at home order that now goes to April 30th. Again, please stay home whenever possible. We have one new confirmed positive case in Erie County to report today. Today's case involves a teenager, so the youngest person in our county so far to be tested positive for COVID-19. The health department is tracing the person's activities and will notify those that are identified. Right now, it seems like this person's contact came through travel. Our negative numbers as of yesterday were 400, and, our numbers since yesterday were 475 total tested, 461 of which were negative. So when you do the percentages, that means we have a 97% negative testing, which means great social distancing practices are happening here in Erie County. So let's keep that up and let's keep that percentage low when it comes to uh, testing negatives versus positives. The state numbers, as we know, continue to rise with over four, with we having 4,845 positive cases across the Commonwealth and 63 deaths. Again, please stay at home to help us stay ahead of the spread here in Erie County. We need you to be our partners in this. We cannot do this without your help and your strong assistance in your social distancing practices. Overall contact tracing by Erie County Department of Health continues on all of our open cases, which means by contact tracing that for each positive report that we get in, there's a health department staff member assigned to speak with first the infected person to find out who they might have come into contact with in the past few weeks. Now think about this. If someone says to you, who did you come in contact with in the last couple weeks? That's hard to remember, but they collect those names and the phone numbers then, and then they start calling those people to inform them that they should self quarantine. And if they develop any symptoms, then they should go to be tested at one of the facilities. So when you hear me say that you will not, you would be identified if you were at risk, that is the process about how we determine who to contact. This process is ongoing because often individuals will remember some details later after we've had our initial conversations with the health department. And it's through the contact tracing that we can now tell you that we believe that we have one case that is likely community spread. Through our interviews with this person and the people that this person was in contact with, the health department has now been unable to determine the source of the infection. Let me explain further community spread. According to the CDC, community spread means people have been infected with the virus in an area, including some who were not sure how or where they became infected. As I mentioned before, when we have a positive case and do the contact tracing, the health department can connect the dots between the individuals. With a good amount of certainty, it can be determined how the infected person came in contact with the virus. Cases of community spread mean that we cannot trace the virus back to a specific source. And the individual picked it up somewhere in their daily lives and we cannot pinpoint where or when. We don't have any further information on the specific case of community spread at this point, but we can tell you with certainty that social distancing is the best way to prevent the spread. This easiest way to spread COVID-19 is from person to person. By social distancing, we slow down that process. That's why we've been telling you, why we've been asking you, that's why the governor has been suggesting that you simply consider that everyone you come in contact with is positive for COVID-19. So limit your time outside of your home, take precautions when you do have to go out, 
Don't touch your face until you've properly washed your hands. Try to not to touch your face at all if you can. Proper hand washing and personal hygiene is imperative. And it's important to understand that our numbers are not expected to remain low, but we will likely have an increase in the numbers of positive cases in the future. This is due to the increased amount of testing that is being done with more facilities now open in Erie County, and also due to those who are not helping us by adhering to the social distancing guidelines. I'd like to mention that we have heard reports that some churches remain open and continue to gather. Please shut down your in-person services in your religious facility. If you're a pastor, a rabbi, an imam, a church elder, or part of the religious of any religious organization, please inform your parishioners that it's okay not to come to church, to temple, to mosque, and then offer up alternatives. Start a prayer chain, use the phone or some video for conference, conferencing technology. Find some way to provide spiritual guidance to your congregation without having them gather in person. Social media is a great way to share messages instead of physically going to church. Our sign language interpreter, Mark, has told me about a great use of that by trying to engage the younger people in their congregation um, during their Sunday services. Keep in mind those who are at high risk, including people 65 or older, who are often the people that we see particularly going to religious services, that they often have compromised immune systems. They're often being treated for other chronic diseases, maybe cancer, heart disease, diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, and then our very young, our infants and children are also at high risk. So we're asking you not only to think about those you know and you care about, but really every person that you don't know in our community. And now I'd like to address the tragic death of the Chautauqua County resident. First and foremost, I would like to extend my deepest sympathy to this individual's family. Having to transfer their loved one from their home community to Erie County was challenging, I am sure. Erie County has the benefit of two major health systems that have the resources and equipment to provide higher levels of care than some of our surrounding counties. Partnerships between hospitals in our region are vital to the care and treatment of all of our residents. Erie County will continue to see transfers from outside of our community. And our hospitals, we can be very grateful, are state of the art, and they take every precaution to ensure the health and safety of all the people who seek care there. Strict guidelines are in place in each one of our hospitals for those who are transferred in with positive uh, diagnosis for COVID-19. But unfortunately, we know that this will not be the only person to succumb to this virus. Please understand, this person was no threat to our public safety, and there are no public health concerns to our community from this untimely and tragic death of the individual from Chautauqua County. Again, we must remember to follow social distancing guidelines. And I know that I keep saying these, this until we see, but I will continue to say this until we see no new cases in Erie County. With regard to reporting on individuals and case by case basis, it may seem like we don't have a lot of information to share. The truth is, it doesn't matter what hospital this person was in. They are all using the same high level precautions and do not cause any public health concern. With, gar with regard to public health information, it's important to understand that your public health department is responsible for reporting on population health, not on individual health. That actually is the purview of our acute care centers, not our public health department. So far, the numbers have been fairly low, so we've been able to share with you some vital information and details about the 16 cases that we have. Moving forward, we may not be able to provide as specific information as we have. Just know that this team is doing our best and our team of experts is doing an impeccable job managing all of the moving parts of this pandemic. 
Our enforcement inspectors continue to make their rounds. To date, this was as of last night, we have received a total of 284 complaints and have conducted 97 field inspections on our businesses in Erie County. 89 of those inspections were in compliance. Our enforcement task force continues to work with our businesses to help them come into compliance. Again, if you have any questions or concerns about enforcement or symptoms, please contact the health department at ecdhinfo at eriecountypa.gov or 814-451-6700. For more information related to COVID-19, including fact sheets, business resources, family resources, videos, translations, and much more, please visit eriecountypa.gov. You can also find information on the social media accounts for Erie County PA and Erie County Department of Health. And now I would like to invite President John Trisilla to say a few words about the status of the court system here in Erie County. Judge Trisilla. Thank you, County Executive Dull Camper. I also want to personally thank you for your spirit of cooperation and the information that you've provided the citizens of Erie County and certainly the teamwork that you've exemplified with the court system. As people know, we share a common building and there are approximately 450 courthouse employees, court employees, and of course working in conjunction with the county executive and uh, her staff. Um, there has been a great effort and team uh, spirit about uh, the collegiality that's uh, sharing information and trying to work within a system under very trying circumstances. I think the people of Erie County know that on March 17th, I issued the first ever judicial declaration of an emergency impacting our Erie County Courthouse. What that meant was we restricted our operations to only essential type of hearings. Those were enumerated and then reaffirmed by our Pennsylvania Supreme Court's order, which came a day later and again listed the same types of hearings that we had enumerated. Today, I took another step in the direction of trying to stay ahead of a very fluid situation by extending that emergency declaration and extending the time to May 4th, which is a Monday. I took the uh, template and the working order of Governor Wolf, certainly the guidelines offered to us by County Executive Dahlkamper and our national standard, and they had identified April 30th, which is a Thursday. I thought it was prudent based on court scheduling to carry it through the weekend until the Monday, uh, May 4th. That got us through our April trial term and put that on hold, and the emphasis was to remain open, but only again for those emergency or essential types of cases. That would include, for example, protection from abuse orders, emergency protective orders for children, uh, addressing defendants who are incarcerated and may need a hearing. And uh, to that end, I'd also like to send a note of, of um, commendation to our warden, Kevin Sutter, and our deputy warden, Michael Holman, they have really jumped on board with our attempts to meet the due process needs of our defendants who are incarcerated at the Erie County Prison and have obtained extra video conferencing machinery and uh, logistics to accommodate conference rooms for these hearings to take place. So those are still continuing. We have reduced our judicial calendar uh, exponentially and what what I mean is our goal was to reduce the public foot traffic at the Erie County Courthouse to protect not only the citizens we serve, but also the county employees working at the courthouse. Um, for example, on a typical day, if you looked at the numbers of the public coming to the courthouse for court hearings or matters, it was approximately 1,500, 1,485. Today, before I came here, I checked with the Sheriff's Department at the front door and we've been averaging around 20 people a day or less than that. That to me signifies that you are taking this very seriously, uh, which has been emphasized by our county executive. The courts are taking this seriously. This is no joke. This is, uh, this is something that has impacted all of us and requires each of us to do our part. As far as the court system is concerned, 
we have spent uh, contemplative time in, in creating an infrastructure to get to those vital hearings, but again, have essentially shut down the courthouse, uh, but still have a crew functioning. So we have some judges that are on duty and on call, and we have been, I think, uh, meeting the needs of the people. So again, the judicial declaration of the emergency has been extended to May 4th. I do appreciate the teamwork, uh, again, exemplified by County Executive Dahlkamper. I also want to give uh, a note of thanks to our Court Administrator Bob Cataldi, and um, everybody has jumped in to a person um, to try to stay ahead of a very fluid situation. So again, thank you, County Executive Dahlkamper, for this opportunity to address our citizens. Thank you so much, uh, Judge Trusilla, and um, I think the citizens of this community should be very proud of their county government collectively that we are working as one to make sure we not only protect the citizens of this community, but help protect every person that we serve on a daily basis and protect those who work for us. So I want to thank the courts, President Judge Trusilla, for being a partner in this and his entire staff. Uh, they've just been great to work with and we'll continue to work together to protect all of you. So now I'm gonna take questions from the media and those questions could be for me or for Judge Trusilla and we'll start with the Erie Times News today. Do we have anyone with us from the Erie Times Hi. News? Yes, Kathy, it's, it's David Bruce. Um, can, can you talk a little bit more about um, the churches that aren't complying with the order? Is this a, a large number of churches? Are these large churches or smaller ones? And um, are you considering this weekend um, sending any kind of law enforcement to make sure that the, um, the stay at home um, policy is in place? So the reports that have come into us have been um, reported by citizens and uh, anecdotal information that churches are still gathering. We know many, many of our churches did close uh, this past weekend and maybe some even the weekend before and obviously we're very grateful for that. So I just wanted to have a special request out there to all of our religious organizations uh, and ask them to remember this is about their congregants. This is about the people that come to worship with them and how do we keep them safe. So we don't have um, notice of a, a widespread uh, continuation of religious services, but there are a few pockets here and there, and that's who um, I'm trying to reach out to today. And have you talked to any um, leaders of those churches directly? I have not talked to any uh, religious leaders directly. Most uh, churches just took it upon themselves to shut their doors as they, uh, as the stay-at-home order came forward, and even um, beyond that, if some of them hadn't, they now have. So again, I think most are trying to comply. But my concern is always, you know, for the safety of all, and particularly I know that many people who feel even a greater uh, need personally and an obligation sometimes to go to church are often the people who are older and probably some of our most vulnerable population when it comes to COVID-19. Okay. But Kat, I just want to follow up one quickly. Just what happens if you hear that this weekend services continue? So we do have an enforcement team, and we have um, them on call over the weekend also. And what we've been trying to do uh, with all businesses, and a church would be no difference, is to go out and visit and to um, tell them why they need to be shut down and uh, help them to be compliant. And I would assume that any religious organization that would be open would become compliant if we were to find that out over the weekend, which is probably the most common time when they would be having a church service. Talk Erie. Thank you. Yes, hi, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon. According to the Erie Times News' top 50 employers list from February 16th, the county of Erie is listed as the number 10 top employer in Erie County. Do you anticipate announcing layoffs soon due to the, to the economic impact of the COVID-19 crisis? So, um, Joel, we are constantly looking at um, our financial situation and making decisions um, based on that and based on our need. 
Uh, many of our operations cannot shut down. Of course, you can probably figure which ones those are. We have the 911 call center. We have the jail. Uh, we have uh, those who are working to protect uh, the most vulnerable of our community through the Office of Children and Youth, which obviously involves the courts, as the president judge just talked about, uh, domestic abuse situations and other situations like that. Um, and right now, we have a health department that is fully staffed because this pandemic is uh, in the realm of uh, a virus. And so there are people working there. We've actually transferred some people from other departments who have the skill set to work on the pandemic from their former departments to, uh, to be under the COVID-19 response. And then we are taking our other employees and we're rotating them and trying to really reduce our workforce and yet to keep vital functions still happening. Um, internally. So uh, we are down to about 25% of our workforce or less, depends on the building, um, in-house. And uh, the rest, uh, we have many people working from home. And then we are trying to rotate some of those people in and out who um, maybe don't have the ability to work at home to uh, give others relief. So at this point, we are not talking about any furloughs, any layoffs. But uh, this is a fluid situation. And we will watch our finances carefully. Um, I guess you know people often complain about property taxes. I've talked to my uh, fellow uh, county executives who are in states where they depend on sales tax for much of their revenue. I guess we're in a better place here because property taxes are how we get most of our revenue and we're not dependent on sales tax, which we know is uh, devastated right now in terms of a source of revenue because people aren't out and spending because they're not going outside. They're not leaving their home. They're not going yes. shopping. Thank you. Just for clarity, so there have been zero layoffs from the so far, correct? We have no layoffs in county government at this point. We have stopped hiring. Um, I think uh, we have had no job postings. There may be a couple job postings coming up um, for our corrections, uh, for corrections officers, but uh, only job postings we will have will be in those vital uh, departments that, um, you know, we, no matter what happens, we, we need to fully um, have full employment in those departments. But otherwise, we will have no new hires coming. That is one thing we are doing. And we're very carefully watching our spending and obviously not um, allowing any uh, procurement or uh, spending on anything that's absolutely not essential for the fight uh, against the COVID-19 virus or um, you know, more of an emergency expenditure within county government. How about Erie News Now? Hi, a question for you about this case of community spread. Um, any clue on the person's age? And also, uh, how worrisome is this in terms of having our first case of community spread and, and thus the possibility of seeing more? So I don't have uh, information on the vitals on this uh, individual. What we do know is um, through our contact tracing, we just could not connect the dots to either a contact with a positive COVID-19 individual or a travel outside of our region, uh, either um, nationally or internationally, that would have resulted in the transfer of that uh, virus to that person. So it's always a concern, and this is what we've been talking about since day one. Um, if you think that every person that you might come in contact with, whether that be your neighbor next door, whether that be someone you work with, whether that be somebody you see in the grocery store, the grocery store clerk, clerk, even think of yourself, you might be the carrier of COVID-19. If everyone thinks that way and we social distance and only are close to the people we live in the same house with, that means staying away from your grandchildren, your best friend, your uh, close running mate you know, that you, you jog with, uh, on and on and on. You need to stay at least six feet away from everyone that you come in contact with. It is normally person to person. Uh, I know I talk about surfaces and, and that the virus could be on surfaces, and that can be true. But the easiest way for this virus to jump from one person to another is from that person directly to the other person. So uh, social distancing works. We know it. It is the tool that we have. And so it is a concern that we have someone who we can't pinpoint. But um, I have believed, I think as my whole team believes, that uh, there are people out there carrying COVID-19 that we don't know about. And so uh, we all need to realize that and be obviously extra vigilant. 
if I may follow up on that, sure. without by any means trying to instill fear or anything like that, but at the same time while being realistic, is it reasonable to assume that this will not be our last case of community spread, that this is just kind of the start of this thing? I can uh, probably say with pretty good certainty that we will see more cases of community spread, um, and eventually it may get to the point where we don't really, it doesn't matter anymore whether it was travel, whether it was contact, or whether it was community spread, we just know that it's, it's spreading in our community. So you're right, that's what's happened in many other communities. We hope that we still are ahead of the curve. I still believe we are. I will give you some good news. Yesterday I talked about this Unicast uh, website that's um, looking at our social distancing scoreboard and uh, they now rate us as a C. We were a D when I had looked at it earlier yesterday, and now we're at a C, which means we have a 20 to 30 percent de decrease in our average distance traveled. Um, Allegheny County, I think I saw, is up to a B. I'd like to make us an A, so we need everyone to help us. You've got to stay close to home. You've got to stop moving around this community. Um, limit your travel. Only one person in your household hopefully goes to, out to the store when you need to. Um, and I even talked about this last week. My daughter was going to the grocery store. She picked up a few items for me. She dropped them off in front of my house so that I didn't have to go to the store. And if people can limit their time out away from their home and especially going into another building, that will help all of us um, do a better job with social distancing. Jet TV? Yeah, hi, Kathy, Samir. Uh, so I want to circle back around to uh, the Chautauqua man who was in his 80s at Pasteur and Erie. Do we know what hospital uh, that happened at? So the hospital is responsible for their own patients. That's not something that the community um, or the, the um, public health department is responsible for. We are responsible for our own cases and, and tracking those, the Erie County cases of which we have 16, of which none of them are hospitalized. So I'm just gonna go back to that message that uh, this was a case that came from uh, Chautauqua County into one of our great, uh, highly trained, um, well-equipped medical facilities. And um, you know they, I believe, probably took as good care as this individual as they could, but the individual was elderly and um, we know that the COVID-19 virus uh, is most difficult for those who are elderly or have uh, underlying conditions. And then um, I want to circle back around uh, to the teenager case. Are you saying this was the case uh, of community spread with the teenager specifically, or are you just saying one of the 16 in general? Uh, one of the 16 in general. Um, our most recent case, uh, it looks like we're still doing the contact tracing. So again, this, this is something that can take uh, quite a bit of time and it is quite a process. Um, and so it looks like uh, the teenager was a case of travel um, outside of our community. And so, uh, but it is one of the 16 um, that we have been talking about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Erie Times News, do you have another question? Yes, Kathy, I'm, I'm the subject of community spread. You, you addressed, you know, kind of what it means, but does it change any policies with the health department now that there is a case of community spread? Does, is anything done differently now, whether in terms of contact tracing or any aspect of this, now that we, we have a case that you can't trace to a person or to a travel situation? We are not changing any of our policies. We're still doing, obviously, on any new case, the contact uh, tracing as best as we can. Um, you may have heard, um, Secretary Levine talk about how they're not doing contact tracing around the Commonwealth in most instances. That's because they don't have health departments and they don't have the, the ability that we do. There'll probably come a time when we, we hope not, maybe this will never happen, where we would have so many people we just wouldn't have the manpower to do this. But as long as we have the manpower and the ability to do contact tracing, it is important because we can tell others you have been exposed for certainty to somebody who has COVID-19, you need to quarantine for 14 days and protect our community and protect your loved ones and the family and friends that you have. So that's what we are gonna to continue to do as long as we have the manpower and are able to do it. And that will only happen with the cooperation of the people of this community. Is that the biggest advantage you see during this crisis of having a county health department versus the counties that don't have one? 
that you're able to do this kind of contact tracing still and, and perhaps limit the spread? Is that the biggest, or is there some other aspect that you see that even plays a more vital role of having a county health department versus the counties, like a lot of the ones that surround us, that do not have county health departments? So I think having our county health department and the skilled people that we have um, led by Melissa Lyon and her whole team um, is a huge advantage for us and one reason why we are seeing the lower numbers compared to many other counties. I also believe that we took steps very early to try to address this. Uh, we had five active cases in Erie County when I put forward the stay at home order. Uh, we went out on that much earlier than most other counties did. Um, I think that is helpful. I also think it's helpful that our population is just smaller. We're not Philadelphia, we're not Allegheny, um, we're certainly not New York City, and so when you have a smaller population like ours uh, and more open space and we're not living on top of each other as much as they are in other places, uh, we have obviously some social distancing. That's just sort of a natural way that we live. Um, so I think all of those things um, are part of why we're doing well, but I think our community also stepped up to the plate. When, when I started preaching social distancing and our health department officials, um, led by Melissa Lyon, started preaching that, this community listened and many, many started doing it early. Um, and then when the businesses were ordered closed, uh, as difficult as that is, and I understand that, um, our businesses understood why and they complied for the most part. And those who didn't comply shortly did. So um, we've been, I think, ahead of this. We've been ahead of this as much as you could be, um, given our limited abilities and our and our limited uh, scope. But um, we have a lot of advantages in the health department being one of them. Uh, Talk Erie. Yes, uh, Kathy. This is a question from a Talk Erie listener. Is there any data available on the sheer number of employees in Erie County that still have to go to work to a physical location because of the nature of their business as life sustaining, or that they received a waiver? Do we know, like, the percentage of the population that's on the move every day, congregating at work? Just wondering what the efficacy of the stay-at-home order actually is. You know, uh, we do not have those numbers, and um, I'm hoping uh, maybe tomorrow or Wednesday to have James Grunke from the uh, Erie Regional Chamber on to talk a bit more about some business and employment issues for the community. And we had already kind of reached out to see if we could find out how many people are now applying for unemployment. So those are some numbers we're trying to gather so we have an understanding. And I guess from that, we could extrapolate um, how many people might be staying home. It's hard, though, because some businesses, I'll take Erie Insurance, for example, our largest employer, has most of their employees working remotely, working from home. What a great thing we have now in technology that we're able to accomplish this, which we never would have been able to do just a few short years ago. So uh, many businesses that are able to have uh, their employees working remotely, and that's helping. So I think that number is difficult to achieve, but um, as I said, I'm hoping to have James Grunke in here very shortly, and maybe he can help address some of those things with us. Erie News Now. Hi, sticking on the theme of employers, we're hearing reports that there are state police and perhaps county officials either earlier today or perhaps even still now at WabTech. Can you address, A, the veracity of that, and then, B, if it is accurate, uh, what's going on there? We have an enforcement team that's gone out to WabTech today. Um, they were the, still there the last time I heard. Uh, they were there at that point for about two and a half hours already. Of course, we know that's a huge facility, uh, many, many acres, many buildings. And um, we, I had been asking that our environmental enforcement staff be allowed into the plant to, um, to see what kind of measure they had put in place for the safety of their employees, and eventually that becomes the safety of our community. Um, today, uh, we did enter into the plant, and so I'll have more information on that tomorrow. If I may follow up on that very briefly, you say you entered into the plant. Was that... Uh, uh, amicable, shall we say? Were they, you know, doors wide open, come on in? Or was it something where you had to say, we're coming in? And uh, take me through who is out there. Are there any police involved in this? Is it just a small team of county officials? Uh, just wondering what, if any details you can give there. So our enforcement team includes one of our environmental inspectors, and those are people who normally go out to restaurants and tattoo shops and places like that. So they're very used to doing these type of uh, investigations or visits with a business. Um, we have put two 
uh, law enforcement people on a team with each inspector. Uh, they might be county detectives, uh, county probation officers, uh, county sheriffs. It, I'm not really sure who's out there on this particular team with that inspector. But we just thought it was wise during this time to, um, to allow you know, this person to have some other people with them. So there are those three, three individuals that are out there. I don't know exactly who they are. Um, and uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, I had sent a letter to Wabtec asking them to um, allow us to come in. Uh, well, I actually had placed a phone call, I should say, um, asking us to come in. They declined the offer originally. And then uh, yesterday we had a phone call with them, which we were very grateful to have a phone call with them. Uh, that means my, one of my environmental inspectors had a phone call with, uh, I believe, one of their managers at the plant. Um, that conversation went well, and then um, uh, they did, uh, meaning Wabtec, did receive a letter from the secretary of the DCED um, stating that they must allow the um, local officials in to do an inspection on their um, abidance by the compliance procedures that have been laid out uh, for businesses that are open. So that's, uh, that led us to get in there today. And can you tell me just again who that letter was from, telling them that they had to allow people in? That was from the Secretary of the Department of Community and Economic Development, Secretary Dennis Davin. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. WJET? Yep, hi. So um, I want to circle back around to the hospitals and uh, receiving transfer patients of people who uh, might be positive for COVID-19. So are there any um, special precautions, I guess, that are being implemented now for uh, those cases as they travel and come to Erie? So my understanding is, again, this is up to the, this is all within the hospital realm. It's not something that we, we mandate as public health, uh, as the public health entity. Uh, this is all done through the hospital association and the, and the CDC guidelines. So there are CDC guidelines, I believe, that are put in place and, and our hospitals follow those as well as I would assume any other hospital in our nation. So they are using the proper protocol, the proper precautions for anyone that would come in uh, with that diagnosis. And actually, um, it is my understanding today that they are using that precaution for pretty much anyone comes in until they know for sure that that person doesn't have COVID-19. So uh, they're being extra cautious um, as, as we're recommended and as recommended by the emergency management personnel and as recommended certainly by the CDC. All right, uh, thank you. I want to switch gears a little bit now. So uh, we've been hearing that some businesses are cutting like health benefits uh, for laid off workers. So I guess what's the county's reaction to that? You know, it's really unfortunate. Um, and this is going to be my opinion. Uh, it's unfortunate to me that our health care system is the way it is in this United States um, because our health care coverage is tied to businesses in the, for the most part. And therefore, if someone gets laid off, even on a normal time, they lose their health coverage. And we know that this becomes a real problem for many, many people. And now we have a pandemic and we have many people losing their benefits. And this is, could just be compounded uh, during this time. So it's very, very unfortunate. I understand as a business owner myself, my husband, that you know, if you have no money coming in the door, you know, how do you continue to pay people? and how do you continue to pay for their benefits? So I've heard of some people getting laid off but keeping their benefits. The business is able to do that. Others losing their job, losing their benefits. And of course, we know that we have people who are working that had no benefits to begin with and, uh, and they still don't have any benefits. So you know, this goes to, I think, that much greater uh, question that needs to be dealt with on a federal level in this country. And, um, and that is, what do we do about making sure that everyone in this country, the richest country in the world, gets the health care that they need when they need it. Uh, Erie Times News? Yes, Kathy. Um, have, you, have you talked with county officials from counties that don't have health departments and how they're struggling or how are they doing battling this pandemic? I have spoken to other county uh, commissioners, particularly in uh, some of our counties and across the Commonwealth and even across the nation, other county executives um, we have some, I have some regular calls with those uh, individuals. And it is a very big struggle um, in our Commonwealth because they are really at the mercy of the State Department of Health uh, or their hospital in their region. And we know hospitals are about acute care. 
uh, that's, that's where they deal. They deal in acute health care. A health department is dealing in that whole population health care and the health of a, of a region. And so it's a very, very different lens that you're looking through. And of course, the counties themselves don't have any of the type of personnel that we have at our health department to do this very vital work. They all have emergency management, but emergency management in Pennsylvania typically is dealing with a tornado or a flood or a huge snowstorm or some other natural disaster. They're not dealing with viruses typically. So it's, a very, it's the same in terms of an emergency and emergency operations, but it's a very different animal unto itself. And so without having that uh, personnel with the skill set within your own house, meaning the county government structure, um, you really are dependent upon the state, and that's 57 counties out of 67 who don't have a health department. That's a lot of our population. That is a lot of people in Pennsylvania that are looking to one entity, and that's the Pennsylvania State Department of Health. Uh, talk Erie. One last one, Kathy. Thank you. Again, uh, another database question from a Talk Erie listener. Do we have any clue how many people are coming into Erie International Airport on business? maybe from a hot spot like New York or Seattle, Chicago, where they might be going. And uh, the concern is, doesn't this just add to the health crisis here in Erie County? I don't have any data on the travel coming into our community through uh, our airport, nor do I have any data on people coming in through a train, on a Greyhound bus, or in their own private car. Um, what I keep on asking people, if you come back to our community, if you're a resident here and you've been away, quarantine yourself for 14 days. If you have a family member coming from maybe a hot spot, they want to come back to Erie because they want to get out of there or coming from any place in our country, they should be quarantined away from you for 14 days. I was on the phone with my sister-in-law just last night who lives in Missouri. She has a plane ticket to come here at the end of April, something we've been planning for months. She said, well, I was thinking about still coming. And I said, well, if you come, I have to quarantine you for 14 days and you aren't even supposed to stay for only three. So don't come. That's what we need to be saying to people. You know, I'd love to see her, but I can't have you come here because you'd have to be quarantined. And we all need to be using that same language with our loved ones. and make it imperative that they understand if they come here what they're going to face and we all need to make sure that they do that if we're letting them into our homes ma'am just real quick there are businesses that exist in this town that have either headquarters or branch offices in other major metropolitan areas the, the concern was not necessarily the um uh you know the personal or individual mm -hmm. but the businessmen or woman coming into the town. Any concern there? It is a concern of mine. And I, was at, I would ask every business owner to do everything they can to do everything virtually or by phone. And do it in a way. There's so much technology today. Um, there's, we all need to stop moving around. We need to stop sending our employees to other places. If they come back, they should be quarantined for 14 days. They shouldn't go back to work. So can you, get, can you be without them for 14 days once they return? That should be the question you should ask yourself. And so uh, I implore our businesses. I know that your business still needs to function, but do everything you can to put everything online or by telephone. Uh, do not send your employees out to do business at this point. Um, Erie News Now, do you have any final questions? Yes, if I may. Um, very quickly, just one very easy one, and then one that's a little more in-depth. Um, by saying that we have no cases hospitalized, am I correct in assuming that this teenager is isolated at home? That's correct. Okay. And then with this Chautauqua County resident, um, not debating for a moment that it was absolutely the right thing to do to bring him or her, him or her here to our state-of-the-art hospitals for treatment, unequivocally the right move. But when you're bringing in a case of somebody who has a potentially deadly virus, uh, is it really reasonable to say that that adds absolutely no risk to any of the rest of us because he or she would still be around uh, medical personnel who even following the absolute best precautions, we do still seek uh, doctors, for example, getting this? We're a humane society who cares about people, and we also in this country never turn anyone away who absolutely needs medical care. I think that's one of the that greatest things that happens in our country. And I have faith in our medical facilities that they are doing everything that is absolutely possible to do to certainly protect themselves, 
their employees uh, from contracting COVID-19 from any active patient. But I guess if you were going to say that, it would be the same as if we had an Erie County resident that we knew was positive and they suddenly needed to go into the hospital. Would we say, no, you can't come in? Um, I think we all care about the people who live in our community, but I also care about the people in Crawford County or Ashtabula County or Warren or Crawford who may need us also. And so uh, I have trust in our medical facilities and in our medical doctors that they're doing the right thing. Of course, no, but my point in asking that wasn't do you ever turn someone away? Of course not. You always help. But is it more accurate to say that, yes, it maybe adds a tiny bit of risk, but that risk is so, so much worth it that it's, you know, obviously, you know, one you're willing to take? Again, I just go back to the fact that we are a um, human species that cares about each other, and we're going to take care of people. Um, you know, this person obviously was in a very bad situation and needed better care than that hospital or wherever they came from home or I'm not sure how they even came here but they needed care immediate care and they needed it now and um, you know we in Erie County sometimes are sending our people I'm not saying they have COVID-19 but we're sending people to other communities to Pittsburgh to uh, Cleveland sometimes to Buffalo and obviously we're all grateful for that even more advanced health care that we can get when we go there and that's the same thing that our neighbors are asking of us. Uh, Jet TV, do you have any last questions? Yeah, I have a couple. I have uh, one for you and then uh, one for President Judge Trusella. So um, I want to circle back to the churches. So I've heard that uh, some might be holding like a drive through service. So would you also want that to halt for the time being? Well, if everyone is staying in their cars and not going out and being around each other, that could work. I've heard of somebody doing it at a movie theater, like a drive-in. We don't have many drive-ins left in Erie County. Um, I heard of a priest, I think, that was sitting in the parking lot doing confessions from the car. People would stay in their car and they would have a confession with the priest. There's all sorts of ways to be creative um, for our religious leaders to still serve the people that worship with them. And um, that's pass around those great creative ideas to each other. Uh, this is a great time to share what you're doing that can help the situation and yet still stay connected to your congregation. And now I'm glad to turn it over to uh, Judge Trusilla for a question. Hi, Samir. Hi, okay, so really quick, let's talk about the impact I guess this has had on the court system, obviously with these delays and uh, this time we're having right now. Well, uh, you have to take it top to bottom, I think. First of all, the critical cases that are on the clock would be those incarcerated defendants. So under the Sixth Amendment and ap applied through our Pennsylvania Constitution, they have a right to a speedy trial. That time frame is not being calculated or counted against the Commonwealth or the government to bring those cases. Those would be the first cases attended to, you know, hopefully in that May term, which we've extended the emergency order to. Um, as far as our critical hearings, as I say, the essential hearings, we are still getting uh, on a daily basis uh, some of the domestic violence cases. There's been a slight uptick, I would say. Um, don't know what the percentages are, but we have the infrastructure and the guidelines in place to account for those types of cases um, for all citizens of Erie County. We've also had... Um, Again, the hearings today, for example, I had hearings on uh, juvenile delinquents who were in, in uh, facilities and trying to get them home as quickly and expeditiously as possible or accounting for their health and well-being. So the impact, I think, will be at some point in time, you might see a backlog, but I know we've been committed to, to put everything on the table, whether that means longer hours or you know, additional time, we're willing to do that. And uh, so far, um, I think our system has been working, but I did feel the need to extend the emergency. And then about roughly how many employees do you have currently still working at the courthouse? Uh, again, by approximation, if we had 450, we've reduced that. I think we have about 80 that are coming in. Um, and of course, you know, we still have individuals working from home um, and doing their job, but we've reduced it significantly and uh, the overall impact has been really to reduce the amount of traffic and occupancy at our courthouse. Perfect, thanks. Thanks, Samir. 
Does anyone else have a, a question for the judge before we finish up here? Well, I want to finish up um, just thanking again everyone in this community who has uh, really worked hard to try to stop uh, the spread of COVID-19 in our community. We do have one case that we're calling community acquired um, in our community now out of the 16, but we still believe we are way ahead of most communities in stopping the spread of COVID-19. So please continue to do your part. Thank you to the media for continuing to get this important, valuable message out to everyone. And in the meantime, till, till tomorrow, stay home, stay well, and stay calm. Thank you again to Judge Trusilla for joining me.